Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Um, today we have two great info security analysts. We have Shelly Epps and Galen Fassler. And um, Galen is a board member of the North Carolina chapter of Women in Cybersecurity, and she also volunteers for ISSA. It also happens to be her two years of cybersecurity. Shelly is <laughs> um, an information security analyst in healthcare, and she's very skilled in customer service, communication, business process improvement, US vendor and research security, as well as public speaking. So we have some two excellent ladies today who will be having a great discussion with us. Um, part of what we are going to do today. If you have any questions, we will be answering those at the end of this session. So if you can go ahead and if you look on your screen, you'll see a Q&A button. Go ahead and click on that to enter your Q&A so that that's where the official questions are going to go. Um, obviously, you can go ahead and chat among yourselves on the chat, but if you can go ahead and make sure that the questions go in the Q&A session, that would be fantastic. So as of right now, does everyone, is everyone good with how this session is going to go? If you would go ahead and clap for our presenters in the chat session, please. Thank you, <laughs> appreciate it, John. Great, awesome. All right, Shelly and Galen, it is now all yours. And as I said earlier, I am removing my video from this feed. Give me one second and we'll get this going. All right, hopefully everybody can uh, see that. Thanks for joining us tonight. And uh, we're so excited to get a chance to talk to you guys. Galen and I, um, in typical fashion, threw uh, our abstract together literally with about 60 seconds to spare until the deadline. Um, so we're we're glad that it got accepted. We're gl glad to have a chance to talk to you about um, our, our program. Uh, and really, this is a program about uh, how to pivot, right? So what, what the overarching theme should be tonight is how to stay flexible and pivot in the program so that when events like COVID-19 happen, you have an ability to actually adapt and expand um, through those types of events. I'll let Galen uh, uh, introduce herself and give a little bit of background for herself first. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, hey, everybody. I'm Galen. Um, I think I know a lot of you from Raleigh ISSA, and it's really nice to see some familiar faces. Uh, I'm an information security analyst at Duke Health. Uh, I, Shelly's actually my boss, and luckily we work really well together. Um, I've been at Duke since February. So really awkwardly, I only worked there for about five weeks before that we got sent home for uh, COVID. So it's been a bit of a struggle, just not really understanding Duke's culture or anything and having to work from home and, and weather the pandemic. Um, this is actually maybe the favorite, my favorite slide I've ever put together because we wanted to do a before COVID and a now COVID during COVID effect. Um, everybody, please say hello to my one of my cats, Carter, who honestly, there's about a 50% chance she's going to appear tonight at some point. Right. So don't let her kid you. Galen fits right into our culture at Duke. Um, and I'm going to tell you uh, through this presentation, some of the ways that in a very short amount of time, she has integrated herself into our program and has made herself visible and valuable in our program. Um, I think that for me, that is a stark contrast. Like first thing that went was uh, coloring my hair. That's gone at this point, uh, probably never to come back. And um, almost every single day we start the day uh, with Galen's cat deciding that she's a princess who has to be seen uh, on all of our webcams in the middle of our meetings. So that's the two of us. I've been at Duke for a really long time, 25 years. And uh, the last eight years, I have been in the information security office. If you've ever heard me speak before, you probably know that um, I consider myself an accidental security analyst. I came into the field with literally zero experience whatsoever. Uh, the CISO at the time hired me for my communication and my business skills. And those are the skills that have actually let us grow this program 
uh, in a really unique and fun way at Duke. Okay, so um, what I want to talk to you about first is uh, an un unexpected event that we had this year. We were tooling along and I was really excited to bring Galen onto the program as well as starting um, to bring a couple of other people into our overarching program. And uh, we got an email one day from one of my favorite auditors at Duke. And he said, we've decided to audit your uh, end user security awareness program. Well, I've been through many audits at Duke. Um, they're usually like going to visit your dentist. They're not the most fun experience in the world. And so I, I battened down the hatches and I was actually kind of surprised. I, I had never considered the concept that someone would audit a communication process that we were doing. And so um, we, we certainly didn't expect it in the middle of a year that we were dealing with things like we had never dealt before. And ironically, the process of doing the audit and having the pandemic hit all at the same time forced us into a state where we solidified a lot of things that had been tentative and roadmapped prior to that. And it also forced us to really pivot and that process of um, solidifying and pivoting all at the same time grew our program in some really exciting ways that we're hoping to talk you through tonight. Galen? So as Shelly mentioned, before I joined, there was a program in place. Um, there was an approach, there was a strategy, but having me on board kind of helped get everything rolling. I was kind of the person that Shelly could be like, hey, go do this thing. And it was, yes, okay, great, I'll go do the thing. Um, so our overall awareness and training approach is to move, obviously, Duke towards a security aware culture. So our, we're always trying to engage with our users, whether it's through phishing, communications, um, answering their questions when they have them, uh, making sure that they know who we are when they have questions. Um, we work very consistently to make sure people know who we are and where we are. Um, our overarching goal is to make sure that our users are able to find us, able to report incidents, able to recognize incidents, and make sure that everybody knows that our security is up to everybody. It might not be in everyone's job title, but it is all of our responsibilities. Um, Absolutely. So, so right around that time, um, we had a new CISO come on board uh, uh, right before the beginning of the new year. Um, and as part of the CISO coming on board, he sat down with me and he said, Shelly, you know, what do you want to grow? Where do you want to see things go? We were right at the point also where SANS was starting to offer their security awareness professional certification. And so I actually took that very short course for the SANS security awareness professional, as did my counterpart on the university side at Duke. And the the process of going through that course really helped us to think through where we wanted to see our security awareness program heading to and what some of the steps might be to get us there. One of the obvious steps were that we were going to have to expand our bandwidth a little bit. So I'm gonna say a couple quick things about Galen. First of all, I can't recommend enough if you've been uh, in the field for a while and you're of a certain age like I am, uh, hiring a millennial to work with you. Um, Galen has absolutely expanded my influence exponentially. Uh, having her on board and having her be the kind of person that can quickly pick up and take things and run with them allowed me to open myself up to thinking about uh, expanding into some areas that I hadn't had the bandwidth or even really the interest in before. Funny story, um, in the first week that Galen came to work for me, uh, she looked at me and said, you know, you're not really using Teams, right? And I said, okay. Uh, and so before I knew it, she had us set up on Microsoft Teams, had assigned tasks out to everybody on the team and um, had us fully organized and moving forward. So uh, I, I really recommend uh, if you're in this landscape and you've been in it for a while, 
broaden your horizons out a little bit and try to find people to work with who are of different generation, different um, environment, and see what they will do for your program. And then, then the next day, I came in to a bunch of Teams tasks because I taught you how to do that, and I've regretted correct. it ever since. So that is correct. Go ahead. Is this me or you? Yeah, it's you. Oh, okay, great. My name's not on it, so. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, our program initially was started. Shelley and her counterpart they did a, a risk mapping, a heat map of where our risks are <laughs> um, within Duke and what we need to address first, what's our really important thing, things that we need to address, who do we need to engage with? And of course that changes continuously. Um, we had to reassess during the pandemic, obviously that, that has been also a continuous effort to make sure that we're addressing risk as it appears and as we um, gauge that its impact might be a little bit higher. Um, so we do a lot of our training. We're still doing a lot, not, not in person now, um, via video, we're doing a lot of presentations still kudos to Shelly for that. She's managed it really, really well. And you'll, you have obviously already seen that she's great. She's a great speaker and, and has shifted to, to virtual very well. Um, and then we do a lot of communications. We actually had to put one out this morning, which I think we will talk about a little bit later, but our, our communications a lot are also a collaborative process because we have such a huge organization that we have to consider how we how we can reach people best and we always work with our counterparts to make sure that we have the full message that we need to reach everybody right so we had actually done some of this already um and we knew i mean everybody is going to uh resound with this we knew that email was always going to be one of our risks we knew that we had um growing risks in other areas uh that we had a need to expand into what we didn't realize was that we were going to have to rapidly expand into some areas that we never thought were going to be relevant for us like home office networks and taking home work on a regular basis and the prevalence of personal machines hitting the network. Um, some of this had always happened, but we were not fully prepared for the exponential growth in it overnight. Um, and that's true both from a security perspective, an operations perspective, a privacy perspective, and all of these things happened literally um, over the course of a weekend. We also um, knew that we didn't have unlimited resources. And so you can um, come up with everything that you think is a full security package. But unfortunately, not only do you not have the resources to go through all of it, but your user base probably doesn't have the bandwidth or the ability to digest all of it. And so we had already decided before anything happened um, with the pandemic that we were going to shift our paradigm for uh, security awareness. And rather than trying to tell people everything that we thought was important, we were gonna pick the five or six or seven things that we thought were critical and were very likely to happen. And we were going to really focus on those things rather than trying to teach everything. And then this happened. <laughs> and um, I'll, I'll give you a second to digest this concept. We've been joking about this for a little while now. 2020 feels like the year where everything is a tabletop and it's all an unplanned, uh, unexpected tabletop with a sadistic facilitator that is constantly uh, giving you um, closed doors for the creative ways that you are trying to approach the tabletop exercise. Um, We've actually run a couple of real tabletops during this uh, environment as well, but nothing has prepared us to deal with the pandemic like the pandemic has. Nothing has taught us how we're going to get through this and how we're going to have a remote workforce and how we're gonna do things like video consults with our patients and how we're gonna secure um, all of our resources and assets and how we're gonna train our population by being forced to do it um, over the course of uh, seven or eight months with literally very little preparation in advance. Okay, so Galen's going to talk you through um, a little bit about what that week in March looked like for us. Uh, mostly it was actually pretty fun. <laughs> um, so they had just moved us right in February, right when I started 
Duke had moved us into these really fancy new buildings um, in RTP. We had collaborative spaces, we had games, we had free snacks, which is like one of the most hurtful things is that we don't get snacks anymore. There's just, there's no M&Ms. I miss the free M&Ms. So the Friday, it was March 13th. Yeah, um, that Friday, there was a few of us in the office still. Um, they had told us starting Monday, you're gonna work from home. So the couple of us in the office wanting to take advantage of being together for what we thought would be about two weeks. We were, we were kind of anticipating about two weeks we'd be home. Um, we thought, you know, let's go get some, let's go make sure we get, get our free snacks. Let's go play some foosball for a little bit. Let's accidentally hurt Shelly while we're playing foosball. <laughs> we actually, we really did have to end our game because she hurt her finger. We don't really know how. Um, so it was, it was, we knew it was serious. Obviously we knew that we were doing something that was important, that the shift from home, shift to home was not going to be an easy thing, but none of us could have anticipated this. So our immediate needs, you're, you're sending home 38,000 people. Some of them were not working. Some of them are in, in clinic people. So when they went home, they really didn't have anything to do, but for the, for everybody else, a lot of IT people, a lot of our researchers, there's suddenly this need to figure out how do we manage VPN bandwidth? Um, how do we have, how do we have people work from home? What are our standards for working from home? We don't really know. Um, everything from COVID-19 coming out, it's a lot. So there was a huge shift that has taken, I mean, yeah. Right. And so I think that um, some of the things we expected, right, if, if we had really had uh, time to think about it, um, we would have expected some things like it's difficult to shift to remote work. What we didn't um, immediately grasp was not only were we going to shift to remote work, but because we're a healthcare organization, our workload was massively going to increase overnight from things like vaccine and research. And I don't think we all appreciated the emotional impact of um, what the phase one isolation would look like uh, for all of us at the same time. So um, we, we in the security um, group that were uh, involved in security awareness, we pretty much paused all planned activities at that time and we went into response mode. Um, and part of the reason for that is that the workforce was getting seven to 10 emails at least per week with COVID updates. Galen was brand new with us at the time, and she can tell you a little bit about what it felt like to all of a sudden just be inundated with COVID messages in her inbox. It was, it was so overwhelming at some point, I think maybe around the beginning of week two, we'd already gotten so many COVID messages that if I saw something come through my email with the COVID in the um, subject line, I just ignored it. I was just like, I can't, I can't handle this. I, I'm doing what I can and this is so much. Um, but that's why we paused pretty much all of our engagement activities because we didn't want more emails flowing through the environment. Um, we paused um, phishing right away. We thought it's not, it's not, an, this would feel mean. We tried to make our program nice and it would feel mean to fish people right now. Um, we, and like I said earlier, we, we weren't planning for the long term, So we didn't think it was a big deal to just kind of pause our engagement activity and our engagement efforts because it, it didn't seem like it was gonna be this long. Right. Um, it also was just hard at first. We had a lot of Zoom meetings, which are now an everyday occurrence, but people didn't wanna open their cameras. We weren't used to that. Um, and now the reality we're looking at in our organization is that a, our organization is not even going back until after the first of the year. And we were just told that that might not even happen. And for a lot of us, we're planning on just working from home going forward. Um, so right. As security analysts, we actually used to pride ourselves in never opening up our webcams. Um, you couldn't get me to open my webcam back in the day, um, but it is an absolute lifeline now. We have to be able to see each other's faces. We have to be able to read emotion in each other, and we have to be able to have that connectivity. And we found that um, this was really important, too, as we were coming out to people. They needed to see our faces. They needed to be able to engage with us and to still have that sense of humor and that sense of connectivity from the security office. Um, 
we refocused a lot of initiatives to reach people at home. Uh, we did do a bunch of virtual meetings and presentations. We actually purchased a great piece of software um, early in the COVID pandemic. Uh, we're currently using Powtoon. It's not an endorsement. It's just to say it's a, it's a sweet little piece of software that we were able to get very early on. And um, we knew that we were gonna need some way to do more than just PowerPoint presentations or Zoom calls or something else. We needed something that could be sustainable and could reach people in short digestible ways that was gonna be very, very helpful for them. We also immediately implemented a daily team huddle. Um, our, our organization would be a little horrified to hear me call it a huddle because we don't actually solve anything or um, brainstorm anything. What we do is we start every day with about a 15 minute call where we um, have our coffee and we talk. I drink my soda pop or iced tea. We talk, we look at Galen's cat, we make sure everybody's prepared for the day. And then we go off about our work day. And that 15-ish minute time frame every morning is critical for our team to stay connected and engaged with each other so that we feel like we're ready to prepare for the day. And then eventually uh, there came a day when we felt like we were ready to resume our simulated fishing program. So one of the things that we switched to doing because of COVID was doing a video series. Um, so if people ask us to make a video about a topic that they think is important, um, we'll go ahead and we'll, we'll make it with them. A couple of the ones that we've done so far, you'll see um, an encryption policy standard. A lot of a lot of places have these really hard policies to read. So we made a video that makes it a little bit easier to understand, especially with encryption being so important and with, we're all working from home. Um, we're, we made, yeah, all of these. And then I think Shelly, are you gonna play? I am, I'm gonna play just a short clip of this. The Duke IT security offices recently received an FBI alert indicating that U.S. COVID-based research is being targeted by foreign nation states and organized crime. At Duke, we have incredible people who are on the forefront of COVID-19 research, and we have unfortunately already seen attacks aimed at our organization. In this video, we are going to show you some of the steps a cyber criminal would take to try to gain access to your research. In security, we often talk about the importance of having a healthy level of skepticism and distrust. If you ever feel uneasy, learn to trust your gut. Okay, okay. so that'll no. just give you a real quick um, overview. Uh, ironically, what we found very early is that Galen has a wonderful uh, voice for video. And so yeah. I immediately said, I'm not ever going to be the voice of any of these videos. You're always going to be the voice of those videos. But now this was this one that we just showed you was one of the first ones we did. And now I'm really embarrassed by it because it sounds like I was yelling and I wasn't quite comfortable in my video. Yes. We did this because um, we did get that FBI alert around COVID research. We obviously have a huge research organization. We felt it was really critical for us to um, equip them. That's only the first 40 seconds of what wound up being, I think, a four minute video. <laughs> it was really important for us to equip them with the awareness of how they could get their research done and really participate in the COVID research uh, landscape but also take some steps to protect their research and our brand and um, our websites and everything else from getting indexed and winding up uh, as high priority targets for COVID attackers. So annual security training was on our roadmap of something we needed to redo. Uh, when I onboarded at Duke, I didn't really see security training. We had, it was, there was some, and it was embedded in another training that's about an hour long. That is, it's it's an hour long training. So you you get it. Um, it was embedded within our, our compliance and our HIPAA training, which is, well, you get it. Um, so it really wasn't a, a built out security training. Um, right. So we knew we needed to update that. And uh, that was one of the one of the first things that was like a really big initiative for me at Duke. Um, so we did end up developing our standalone training. It was honestly something I didn't know that we would be able to get done because we were all working from home for COVID. 
Um, it took a lot of collaboration across the whole um, institute. We had to work with our branding people, our accessibility people, our communication people, our LMS team, our identity team. We did a pilot test of it with all of IT, um, which ended up actually being awesome. Uh, so we, instead of having just a few short sentences about passwords in the old training, we developed uh, the standalone training, which is three videos. Um, our challenge there was to make sure we kept it under 10 minutes. Um, I was doing something recently with another group and they said, how do you make this sound interesting? Because I hate to say it, it's really boring. And I was like, you're not wrong. And I think we did a pretty good job of making sure that we didn't get too into the weeds. We touched very lightly on some of these topics, but we made sure to include everything. And there's a little bit of a, of a, a teaser for you here. Yeah. Welcome to the Duke Information Security Awareness Training. This training consists of three short videos, which should take a total of nine minutes to watch. This training video covers common threats to Duke. The second video outlines tools and techniques you can use to improve your security, and the third tells you how to protect sensitive information and report security incidents. All the links shared in these videos can be found on our website at security.duke.edu. Technology can sometimes feel overwhelming, but there are ways that you can protect yourself and Duke. Our approach to security includes a combination of technical tools and security education and awareness. In these videos, you will get an introduction to your role in keeping our systems and information secure. Each person in the Duke community, no matter what they do, has access to information and systems that an attacker would like to have. This means that you are a potential target. Attackers leverage emotions like trust, fear, sympathy, and excitement to create a sense of urgency and to catch you off guard. And they do their homework, often using Duke websites and social media for lists of names and other information that will make the attack more realistic. Attackers can include foreign nation states, organized crime, individuals looking to create havoc, and even malicious insiders at Duke. Okay, so that'll give you um, just the barest teaser of what that looks like. We find that um, when we did our pilot testing of this, it had such great user acceptance uh, from our user base. Uh, they had spent so many years having minimalistic security training and also getting things like our paper secure system usage memo, which is a five page memo that they were required to read to understand their basic security posture, that pivoting and um, doing this type of short video based training really was something that they were ready for and very excited about. We had also been um, working hard on our simulated phishing program. Um, and ironically, right when Galen hit the ground is when we did our first, what we call big fish. Big fish is the simulated fish that we run twice a year against the entire Duke Health enterprise. And um, in February, I think it was two weeks after she started, um, I, I said to her, congratulations, today we're running Big Fish. And we sent a, um, a phishing, a simulated phishing email out to 37,000 users that said, um, somebody wants to send you a Valentine uh, e-card, click here to retrieve it. And we had a very, very high click rate on that fish. But more importantly, Galen and I spent the entire week uh, sitting there carefully watching and responding to email, hoping that nobody would be mortally offended uh, by us phishing them and um, continually saying to people, thanks for letting us know, that's not a real fish, that's a simulated fish. Here's how you can report suspected fish with that report fish button in your Outlook client. We must have sent out hundreds of emails um, over the course of that first week. We have a very non-punitive program. It's aimed at user education around phishing risks. They're met with an end-time message reinforcing the need to be cautious. We reward good behaviors by drawing a reporter of the month um, and recognizing them with a CISO challenge coin. In August, we did our second big fish and it was that one that you can see there on the screen. You were tagged in this photo from last week, enjoy. And we tried to even make it really easier 
by having the URL rewrite to go to stop. Seriously, do not click this.com. And we still had quite a few users click that. Um, we're really proud of our simulated phishing program. And ironically, having a second person working with me has allowed us to massively expand this program. Um, we had a number of groups that early on chose to opt into our monthly fishing program instead of our twice annual fishing program. Uh, we had it on hold between March and July, but since that time we have been enrolling entities that wanted to into that monthly opt-in. And what you're looking at on that right side there are our click rate um, changes. The blue bar is, um, is February and the orange bar is August. And you can see across the board, all of Duke has, in, has improved in um, their click rate. We've had a lowering of our click rate. What you don't see evidently is that on the left side of that graph are our opt-in groups. The ones that are seeing that massive reduction in click rate are the groups that have opted into monthly or quarterly fishing. The ones that are doing it twice a year are the ones that are on the right side of that graph. If you look at the bottom graph, that's our report rate. And again, the blue bar is February and the orange bar is August. Look at that first entity there that went from a 5% report rate up to over a 35% report rate. That's because those are the opt-in groups. So we're really, really proud of this program, but we've, we've seen that we did have to take a break from it. And actually um, just this week, we had a new group that was scheduled to be enrolled in this program. And um, the, the night before we were going to enroll them in the program, we called them and canceled as a result of the healthcare um, uh, attack that is on the horizon that we're seeing right now with the alert being put out by Health and Human Services and the FBI because we never want to use our program in a way that is going to um, cause stress or anxiety for our end users. When our auditor came, um, some of the things that he asked us about were, what does our annual security training look like? And thankfully, we were just at the point where we were standing these modules up and we were able to say, this is what it's going to look like. It's going to be in the LMS. It's going to be tracked. It's going to be um, pushed out to everybody in our entity. It covers materially everything that we think needs to be covered. And he was very excited about that. He asked us about our simulated fishing program. And in fact, we get asked about our simulated fishing program on a regular basis by groups like JCO when they come to audit us or by other regulatory and external bodies. And it also helps our cyber liability insurance to have this type of program. So we were able to package all of that information up and hand it over to our auditor and say, this is why we do this. This is the impact of it. And our auditor was very, very pleased with that. Happy Cybersecurity Awareness Month. We're almost done. Anybody else feeling tired? Um, so in a normal year, Cybersecurity Month would be having a booth, you know, having a table somewhere um, for us on campus around anywhere that we have places handing out information, trying to engage with people, obviously not possible this year. So we actually were, we have this tool, it's what we use for phishing, but it also has this really great, great training behind it that we had never really explored. We'd been meaning to explore it for a long time. And then thinking about what we could do for cybersecurity awareness month, we decided let's look at the platform. Um, so we, we leveraged this tool we were able to set up, um, if you see you see on the screen, the begin intro to phishing, that was uh, required for this. So we told everybody, we sent out a communication that said, hey, Cybersecurity Awareness Month, if you do one training, you only have to do this one training, you'll be entered into a drawing to win an Apple Watch. Um, and then we had about 20 other modules that we um, put together through, our, through this tool that they, they created it for us. We went through it, we modified it where necessary. And then we, we set them loose. Um, so they have access through the end of this month. And then we will go through and we will, we will have some prizes for them. Um, participation was completely voluntary. We were hoping to entice them with an Apple Watch. And then we'll have um, some other swag. We've actually been pretty successful with it. We've had a lot of really great feedback 
from the people who have taken the, the modules and we're pretty, um, pretty pleased. You can see here some of that feedback that we've gotten, um, which is fantastic to hear. And then, so our, we have a couple of different prize tiers that we've tried to compel people with. Um, as I said, the, if they just do this intro to phishing, they, uh, they're entered into get an Apple Watch, but then they can do five modules and they get a swag bag, which is stuff that we've put together from the security office. And if they do, I don't remember how many modules it was, but then they get a t-shirt on top of the swag bag if they're doing a drawing. But um, so far we've had really great feedback and it's been a really fun experience. Yeah, what's not going to be the most fun experience is um, Galen and I and our team getting together and um, packaging up hundreds of prizes. Um, we know that we're giving away two Apple Watches uh, in our grand prize drawing, but we're also giving away at least 100 additional prizes in drawings. And um, because of the restrictions around COVID, we're going to have to package all of that and mail it out to people. Um, good news is we're using up a lot of swag from prior years uh, that we were ready to get rid of so that we could purchase some new swag. The bad news is um, I've had to have my living room overtaken with um, bags of fidget spinners and carabiners and pens and um, camera covers. Um, I will say this, yeah, I will say this. This has actually been one of those pivot moments. Um, we, we have really strong pathways for Cybersecurity Awareness Month that we use every single year. There are events that we're always invited to. Um, we hand out a lot of swag. We do a lot of handshaking. We ask a lot of questions and we answer a lot of questions during Cybersecurity Awareness Month every year. And as this was looming toward us and the pandemic was showing no signs of letting up, um, this was one of those moments that was an aha moment where we were in looking at the phishing platform one day and we realized that all of these training modules were in there as well. And I don't even remember who it was, but somebody was like, what if we just did that this year? And it was such a pivotal moment for us to realize we could still have a significant impact without putting people at risk for infectious disease um, by doing this. And so we're, we're actually really proud of this. We're looking forward to seeing the impact of it and the modules that we curated. We chose intro to phishing because that's our biggest risk. Um, but we also curated modules around mobile apps and mobile permissions um, around some very simple fun modules that are a great save series. Got a soccer goalie that comes in. Um, and we looked at a few other things that we thought were really helpful, like how to read those proof point URL rewrites that are hard to read, um, multi-factor authentication, some of the other types of things that we had been meaning to really push, but this was a great opportunity for us to allow people to self-select into it. And in October, it was also a great opportunity for us to get funny and creative in a couple of other ways. This is not our only new Zoom background, um, but it's the one that we're pretty proud of. This is Duke Health that you're looking at. And um, we have found that a lot of our executive executives actually really love this Zoom background. They love the brand. They love seeing Duke in the background. Um, and we love the fact that we get some guerrilla marketing with the security.duke.edu um, website and also the hashtag ThinkSecure, which is our brand this year. Okay, back to the audit. So um, it's really important that, uh, that this year, that I stress enough that this year has forced us to think on the fly. I'm gonna show you some of the roadmapped items that we had on our security roadmap. I knew we were gonna to get to them eventually. I just didn't realize how COVID and um, being virtual was going to force us to take these pathways. Well, one thing that we had a roadmap for was something called IT Security Academy. And it had been on there for a little while. Um, and one day in the middle of the pandemic, our help desk reached out to Galen and I, and they said, hey, we have some staff members who are interested. Could we come and, and shadow you guys? And I said, no, of course not, right? Because that would be in my home right now. But it allowed us to have a conversation and to say, what if we let you um, uh, come to a session 
and each of our security managers will present to you and your team and then you take that and you go back and we do a train the trainer model and we'll see what uh, conversations that stimulates and they were really excited about that and then I got really excited about it because I was like wait a second if we invited this if we if we extended this invitation to um, some of our other areas of our IT organization and some of our embedded IT people we could pretty much call this an IT security starter account Academy, and that's exactly what happened. We now have strong bones for a virtual security academy. Every month, one of our security managers puts together a 60-minute presentation. They share with our IT staff, a subset of them, what they think is important. And then those IT staff take that information along with a two-page uh, takeaway sheet back to their organization, and they do a train-the-trainer model for it. And um, this was a really fun moment for Galen and I on one of those Zoom calls where I could see her looking at me and going, what are you doing here? And the next thing you knew, we were working together to put something really exciting and, um, and, and something that we could hand up to our executive leadership and say, this fits that bill. This fills that need that we said we were going to have. Meanwhile, um, our, our other two initiatives that were roadmapped that we told our auditor about, and I would encourage you to be careful about this, by the way, when our auditor came to us, um, I said to him, well, one thing that is on our roadmap that we um, have in the works is a security advisory committee, and the other one is a security ambassadors program. And our auditor is super smart, and um, at one point, he had lulled us into a nice state, and he he turned and said to Galen and I on a Zoom call, so tell me more, who all is on your security advisory committee? And I was like, huh, well, those would be the executives that are embedded in our phishing program. We trust that they will work with us every month and that they will tell us about the tone of their entity, what their tolerance for security information is, what their gaps are and the things that they need. And they're gonna give us their leadership and support and work really closely with us. And he said, cool tell me what your security ambassador program looks like. Who are those people? And I could see Galen's eyes were getting kind of wide at this point because she knew I might have been making a little bit of this up <laughs> on the spot. Um, and I said, oh, well, our ambassador program, um, those are all of the um, research data security reviewers that we have. Uh, they are embedded people and their job is to review data storage plans for our researchers. And oh, by the way, we have this virtual security academy that people are coming to every month. And those guys that come every month, they've pretty much self-selected into an ambassador role. So that's our ambassador team. And our auditor went, all right, great. And then he moved on. And then I wiped the sweat off my yeah. brow and was like, wow, yeah. whew, look at it that. Was, it was a thing of beauty to watch. I was just like, I don't know where you're going, but oh, that was good. Was Sometimes great. necessity breeds innovation. I don't actually recommend that because then we had to turn around and go build our advisor and our ambassador program out of these people. But the irony is if I had had longer to think about it, I would have come to the exact same conclusions. Those are the exact right people to be in our advisory board and to be in our ambassador program. And we have in October invited all of them formally to be in our program with a little gift as a lure. They're gonna get that same t-shirt and swag bag that everybody else gets. And oh, by the way, it turned out to be fairly critical that we did that when earlier this week we found out from the Health and Human Services and the FBI that there was this healthcare ransomware event horizon that was out there and we needed an immediate way to really distribute communications that were eminent and credible to trusted embedded internal people. Because although I spent a goodly portion of the day working with our comms people, drafting our all Duke um, messaging around this event, I also knew that all Duke messaging 
um, doesn't always hit. If you send something through a super official looking um, email com, a lot of times people will gloss over it. But if somebody deeply embedded in their group says to them, hey, this is important. Don't overlook this. Step away from your keyboard. Let's make sure that on VPN, we're being really, really careful right now. They're more likely to listen to that. And so ironically, um, did I mention that 2020 has been a living tabletop exercise? Because this was a perfect tabletop moment for us. It was a perfect moment for us to say, we said we had this in case we ever needed it. Oh no, we need it. Let's see how it actually works at that point. And good news, um, we actually got back the findings from our auditor um, in, a, in a moment that I've rarely ever seen before. We got back a um, extremely clean audit that had no findings, no suggestions, no recommendations. It went to our board of directors at Duke um, in a very short amount of time at Duke through the fishing program, through the audit, through our awareness and training, Galen, although she's been at Duke in less than a year, has actually met um, the presidents of our hospitals, uh, has met our senior leadership team in our IT organization, has met um, some of the members of our board of directors and has actually presented to them. So we hear a lot, I hear a lot from people about the softer side of security and around awareness and training programs. If you're working in an awareness and training program, I can't begin to stress to you the impact that you can have in an organization and on your personal career by working strategically and in a really um, solid fashion in this domain. We were able through the pandemic that we, we were forced through the pandemic to clarify and document our strategy and our mission. We were forced to take some of our roadmapped items and bring them into reality. We were forced to branch out into some areas of domains like video that we hadn't really used before and gamification that we hadn't really used before. We now have not only a, uh, a really robust and thriving um, awareness program that has annual security training, that has a good simulated phishing program, that has a, a video series embedded in it, that has ambassadors and um, advisors, that has a, uh, a virtual security academy for IT folks. We have all of those and we also have a very defensible audit to rest on. So what we wanted to try to bring to you tonight was not just what our program looks like, but how our program was evolving and, and, and forced to evolve actually into a really positive way as a result of the pandemic. Do you know what I realized, Shelley? What? We, we left out a really good opportunity to use the friends joke, the pivot. <laughs> like. <laughs> Right. How many times did we say pivot? That would have been so A good. lot of times pivot. So good. So I'm going to stop sharing. And I think that what we'll do is we have, um, we're right at 720. This talk ends at 730. So let's see what kinds of questions we have. Hold Our on. first question um, is from Jason Cox. Thank you for, for joining us tonight, Jason. And I think you also said hi to Shelly. So I say it on, on her behalf because I do that a lot. Hi. Uh, who produces your content and what tools do you use to produce it? We produce it. Um, we a lot of times use our university counterparts, um, other people within our, our security group to curate the content. And then we use a tool called Powtoon, um, which is a very user-friendly uh, production tool. Very, very easy to use. We picked it up pretty quickly. Um, and then I do all the, the audio, which is why I get the fancy podcast mic. So. Yeah, uh, shout out to our CISO who, when asked uh, if we could purchase the software and the mic, not only bought us the software, but actually bought us a better mic than we had asked for. So yes. um, we, we develop our own content, but um, I was actually expecting our annual uh, training modules to be really, really hard to do. And they weren't 
not hard, but um, it was a great collaborative effort that involved our accessibility people, our LMS people, our identity management people, um, our counterparts on the university side, our comms people. It was a really, really great collaborative effort. What's the next question? Elizabeth Cole Walker. Hey, Elizabeth. Uh, hey, Elizabeth. What, what other stakeholders did you pilot for training development? What other so, stakeholders? Yeah, well, first of all, we ran all of our training through our two IT organizations. Um, we knew it was going to be a little bit basic for a lot of our IT staff, but we figured that they would also be the most critical of it. And so we did that. We also sent it through our executive leadership, uh, through our comms people um, and the accessibility people. And they did a really, really great job of guiding us. What you um, saw tonight, and we're actually happy to show you more at some point, what you saw is nowhere near where we started with. Um, and, and that's great. That's exactly what we needed. So um, all of those groups, we also pilot tested it on a few end users as well. Um, Elizabeth would also like to know if we developed the phishing program in house or if we're using a vendor. And we, we are, are using, using a vendor. We are using a vendor. We're a proof point shop at Duke. And so, again, it's not in any way meant to be an endorsement. Um, but we have found that with our, our phishing program, what's really, really critical is the approach. Right. Um, we consider that we have a highly successful program, but during the course of this program, one of the people that we had engaged with actually sent us um, an example of a fish from his prior job where in the middle of the pandemic, they thought it was a good idea to fish people still. And the fish was a uh, acknowledgement that it was financially hard, the pandemic. So they were giving everybody bonuses. And then anybody that clicked on their bonus email got a end time message that came up and said, oh, you fell for it. And um, it was brutal. And we are very committed in our program to only having a positive educational experience. A big part of our success is executive leadership buy-in. And Galen and I, every time we bring a new entity in, we do an executive kickoff where um, we uh, outline our strategy to them and say to them, uh, you have to agree to this strategy. And if you come back a month from now and ask us for information, we are not going to give it to you if we've said we're not going to give it to you now. Um, someone in the chat recommended Know Before, which is also a great product. I've used that at other companies. Um, we have we have Wombat from Proofpoint, um, which actually works with our backend, just email filtering, all of that, um, which goes kind of with the next question of have you found that many users use the fish button to report spam and how do we handle that? Sure. We actually, we had a user recently email us, um, send the security uh, team an email with an email that she thought looked suspicious. And we, we told her, you know, hey, we have this great button. And she was like, I didn't know if I was supposed to use that if I didn't know it was really phishing. And we were like, anytime you're suspicious, you just you go ahead and you use that button. And that's, even if it is spam, we'd rather them report it and get an email back from our, our um, analysts that say, hey, this, this isn't really anything to worry about. You can delete it and block them and it's fine. Yeah, one of the funny stories that we um, that we have, and there are many at Duke, um, our CISO has a good sense of humor. And um, so sometimes, you know, he will want to fish people a little bit more funnily than than we want to. Um, he did actually make us uh, rickroll a few of our people, which was fine. It was kind of funny. It was our IT organization, so we knew we could get away with it. Um, but the evolution of our program looks like this. We're at the point in time now where when um, people get a fish, they oftentimes reach out to us and they'll say things like, ha ha, you didn't get me. And we'll go, ha ha, we're not fishing yeah. you. So <laughs> not, not that. Maybe, maybe report that one and be careful not to actually click on that one. Okay, we've got the five minute warning. Um... The, I want to move to Monica's question, which is, uh, you mentioned that you made the decision to resume your simulated fishing program as a remote workforce. How did you determine that this was the right time for the business? The, um, the, the volume of messages had waned a little bit at that point, which was good. Um, so that the COVID messages were starting to wane at that point. And it was clear that this was our new normal. 
it was clear that this was going to be um, not going away anytime soon. And so when it became evident that um, that that where we are had stabilized a little bit, and that we weren't still waiting for that you know magic pill to come that was going to let us all automatically return to work. That's when our 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 executive leadership team made the decision, and um, we had been doing this in our IT organization uh, in October, right at a year. Um, I will tell you a very funny story. Um, Galen and I almost had a, a bus hit you moment uh, recently when we pivoted from our regular uh, uh, link. link based attack into an attachment based attack in our IT organization. And we also thought it was a good time after a year to start auto enrolling them into some training. And um, we didn't realize that the tool that we were using on the back end automatically opened every attachment that comes through our email gateway. The night before we sent that out, I said to her, hey, let's not auto enroll people. It just feels not quite right this month. And so we didn't do it. And had we done it, we would have auto enrolled a thousand of our closest friends into training that day. Um, so you do have to be particularly careful with these types of presentations. Um, but you know, we we worked with our senior leadership team to know when the culture was ready for it again. Yep. Um, Chuck Kessler said he's glad him. he's glad that you finally got a CISO with a sense of humor. He has a great sense of humor. Hey. Chuck is uh, the original CISO, and I owe my entire career in infosec to him. Okay, so we're 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 narrowing down on time, and we do have a lot of questions, and we won't be able to get to them all. But um, before we get to this last one, I wanted to say thank you to everybody for attending tonight and for continuing to support Raleigh ISSA and Triangle Info Secon. We all know. I'm just going to plug them for a second. We all know that um, this is a huge event for Raleigh ISSA, and it allows them to to offer training throughout the year, and so it means a ton to all of us here that you uh, continue to support it. Um, the last question that I really want Shelly to answer, because I think it's going to be really funny, do execs click more on phishing sims than junior employees? We don't release that type of information to anybody. I uh, will say this, there is no differentiation between male and female, between older and younger, between uh, highly educated and less highly educated. It hits us all and our data would absolutely prove that. I knew, you were th I knew that was going to be your answer. I'm just I um, past you. Everyone, let's do a round of applause for Galen and Shelley for their excellent, excellent presentation today. And um, for those questions that did not get answered, if you can go ahead and go to the virtual lounge where you can um, ask the, 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 those questions to the presenters as well. So we'll be in the virtual lounge shortly. We'll Thank you guys. And we do have two more minutes. So um, if there's and I don't know what you guys want to do for the next two minutes, <laughs> except maybe more clapping. <laughs> I'm, I'm actually just like, now that I'm thinking about it, we really missed an opportunity to not have Ross Geller screaming pivot at us. <laughs> like, right. that's, that was like the point of the whole presentation and we didn't even think about it. Right. Like how, right. how, how that's all right. That Again, it's good to see everybody's faces again, by the way, and we'll be in the lounge in just a minute, but also don't hesitate to reach out to Galen and I individually. If you're standing up a program, if you're, you know, hitting on any of the domains that we hit on, reach out to us. We'd love to talk to you. Yeah, again, excellent, excellent job, both of you. you thank, and thank fantastic. you to Arlette for having us. And for Thanks, Arlette. Facility. Thanks. <laughs> All righty.